Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. In this conversation, we're going to continue our talks with people in Israel and Palestine who are involved in the struggle over there at this moment. We're going to talk today with two Israelis in our continuing coverage of this Gaza war. Via Terachansky is a name you know from Real News. Uh, she joins us from Toronto, and she's an award-winning filmmaker. Her film On the Side of the Road is an in-depth look at the denial in Israel of the Nakba. She runs the Winchevsky School in Toronto, which is a social justice Hebrew school for children. Uh, and Leah, good to have you. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. And Oren Ziv is with us. He's joining us from Israel. He's co-founder of Active Stills, which is a collaborative project with photographers using their stills to fight for social justice and to end Israeli apartheid. He's also a writer whose work appears in many journals, and it has been a long day for him. So, Oren, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you so much for having me. I know, I know it's late, <laughs> and you've been, you've been rolling. Let's, let, me, let me just start with that. I want to get a little context. And, Oren, if you just begin, tell, tell us about your day, your last couple of days, and the work you've been doing and where you've been. So, for the last uh, five weeks, uh, I've been uh, covering uh, the events, both in the south of Israel, uh, but also in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. Of course, uh, <coughs> for as for many Israelis and Palestinians, the, the reality we knew before 7th of October completely changed. Uh, personally, I was waking up by uh, sirens on October 7th, and I drove immediately to the south, already on the on the way south, I understood this is not a, another round of uh, violence. I don't like this word, but uh, it's not another, you know, escalation, uh, because unfortunately we are used to cover uh, these events. Uh, but already on the way, we understood it's a big scale uh, attack. And while arriving to the south, uh, already on that day, the first hours of the Hamas-led attack, we realized this is something different. Uh, the lack of police and army, uh, it was clear the Israelis were not ready for it. Uh, the, the, the sites, the things we saw in Sderot and other cities of, you know, just bodies lying around you, you understood that somebody who covers Israel and Palestine for, for, Palestine for almost 20 years, you know that here there's like, on the Israeli side, there's uh, really good fe- first responders and and you know emergency forces and and when you see bodies lying for hours in the street, you you understand the situation and it's not under control. Of course, in the days after, we could also gain access to the the communities, mostly kibbutzim that were attacked uh, by Hamas, and we can witness in first hand uh, the killing of uh, civilians, the systematic uh, killing of civilians. Uh, there and, and of course, in the in the following weeks, we continue to follow this. <coughs> but as well, the the situation inside Israel with the hostages, with the struggles to to struggle to bring them back. But as well, the the huge escalation towards any criticize criticizing voices uh, towards the Israeli government, especially Palestinians. Uh, with Israeli citizenship, uh, the limitation, the very harsh limitation of uh, freedom of speech, mass arrests, arrests uh, prevent, preventing, uh, police preventing any kind of uh, demonstrations, calling even very simple and uh, humanistic things like calling for ceasefire or stop killing children for both sides. So we we've seen the that as well. Of course, as an Israeli journalist, uh, since 2005, we're not allowed to Gaza. And at, at, at this certain point, also international journalists are not allowed to Gaza. So we could see some of the things happening in the north and Gaza Strip from the border. And of course, by uh, talking to people, talking to our colleagues there that are working in unbearable conditions, you know, and taking huge risks and uh, barely surviving the daily life, not to say also the the commentation. You about to say what, Leah? So, Oren, before we break all those things down, um, I really want to focus on the things you were saying. I just was hoping we could take a step back. Um, Out here, outside of Israel and Palestine, the last five weeks, there's been a kind of 
um, amplification of a lot of the uh, issues that uh, media is facing today in terms of access to actual facts as opposed to claims, um, perspective, context, but also um, focus on reliable um, on the ground reporting. And I was just hoping that we could take a minute before October 7th. Could you walk us through what a typical day in your life looked like as a journalist? So before October 7th, I cover political and social issues in Israel and Palestine. Uh, of course, in the months before, I was intensively covering the protests against Netanyahu and against the legal changes his extreme government was uh, promoting. But of course, the, also the situation, uh, the, daily rea- the daily reality in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, uh, protests against the occupation and settlements and just uh, daily stories, a lot of uh, settler violence and the uh, displacement of uh, vulnerable uh, Palestinian communities in Area C, things that we see now increasing, uh, but trends that we were seeing and documenting for many years, and more specifically since the the, the formation of this uh, new extreme government uh, j- last January. So uh, I know, you know, because I've worked in, uh, as a journalist um, in Israel, I, I, I know a lot of journalists that um, cover the conflict, but you, you're kind of unique in that group in the sense that um, I've never seen anybody that covers as many things as you do. Um, you're on the ground everywhere, all day long, every day. And I was just wondering if you could just walk us through, like, what does that look like? How do you get to everywhere? How do you do the kind of extremely high level journalism that you're doing? What does so, a, a typical day in your life look like? So a lot, a lot of it is research and contacts because I work for so many years. So I have contacts in different communities and activists and researchers and other groups. And before a lot of the work is reached research and being in contact with people, understanding uh, where the stories, uh, where things are going to happen. And many times also arriving there and documenting before it becomes a, uh, story for the mainstream media. Um, So a lot will be that, just going out, meeting people, even if you don't take photos or write about it, uh, just to know people, to know new areas, new stories, new new trends, new new developments on the ground because things are changing uh, daily. Uh, And then, of course, just, yeah, trying to to go to as much as many events as uh, as possible, if it's demonstrations and if it other things or documentation of daily life. But uh, I think by going outside to the field and being on the ground, you you learn of a lot of things and many of the stories that I do and that we do on 972 uh, magazine is uh, is a result of of this of, of seeing the small so-called small changes which develop into to, to big political changes. I'd like to ask you both as well, picking up on some of that, I mean, this moment seems different than things in the past. I mean, you can dissuade me of that in our, in our listeners, but I, it, that you, when, when you see the destruction in Gaza, that what is it now, 10, maybe 11,000 people killed, 70% of them being women and children, who knows who's under the rubble, the huge death toll of now we're saying 1,500 plus people in Israel itself. There's just so many kind of, you've got this right-wing fundamentalist government sitting in Jerusalem and being attacked by liberation forces, but they happen to be pretty nationalistic and fundamentalist as well from the Islamic side. And this just seems, it, you know, and then with the repression that you read about inside of Israel, stopping demonstrations, not letting people uh, oppose the war, all that's going on as well. And, and just Netanyahu and his government refusing to do, even think about a ceasefire. So I lay all that out just for a second because I, I, it just, just feels so different than other wars that I've covered, that have been part of when it comes to Israel-Palestine. Do you, do you see that? Something has shifted, it feels to me. Leah, do you want to start, Leah? I mean, watching this from the outside, for sure, it feels um, catastrophic and cataclysmic um, in its scope. Uh, Uh, The last war I covered on the ground was 2014, and I thought that that was the worst thing that we've experienced, Um, Tsuketan, uh, uh, protective edge war. 
but um this war right now it feels like uh 2014 on steroids mm-hmm. um both in terms of the level of the catastrophic um, humanitarian crisis in Gaza and also how the, that intersects with all of the fascistic movements and moves that various bodies inside of Israel, including the government, have been pushing for um, in terms of repressing um, protest and, and certain voices and uh, conglomerating uh, power inside of Israel. So this feels like Um, an escalation on a level that we have never seen before. But that's, like I said, from the outside. I'd love to hear, Ole, does it feel like that from the inside? Uh, For sure, it feels very, very different and much harsher than we ever seen before in different levels. And of course, I cannot even imagine what it means to people living in Gaza. I can talk about the Israeli side more. start with, I think it doesn't matter what your political views are, I think most Israelis uh, thought that, you know, was despite the, the corrupted government and we know what they're focusing on and, and we, know the, we know what their plans is, but most people thought that still, you know, the Israeli army will protect the Israeli citizens, if really needed, on the basic, you know, and that this wall with Gaza that was was built with billions of dollars uh, would protect them, and this was proven, you know, that it's it's it didn't, you know, it <laughs> it was proven wrong on October seven. All this conception completely collapsed. People, you know, our friends, people we know were in the safe room for hours, more than 12 hours, calling for rescue, and nobody came. So there's a... So be, before all the analysis and the context and what happened before and after, on this day, but also on the week since, people feel there's no state. Nobody protected them. Uh, afterwards, groups of civil volunteers were dealing with housing and food and helping many of them the activists from the anti Netanyahu protest. So I think it's 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 a big shock. It's also maybe the you know the deadliest event since uh, forty eight for Jewish Israelis. So so it's so before everything, it's just a bit. It's a big shock uh, for everyone. Now from that you can continue to 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 the political changes and. To things that are happening, but this is a important uh, feeling to 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 understand. And unfortunately, on based on this true feeling, now the calls for revenge and for occupying Gaza, erasing Gaza, and all the horrible things uh, that we're hearing, they're based on this feeling of many Israelis. So, uh, as you know, I've been talking to many of the families of uh, victims, yeah. of survivors, of people which their family relatives are held in Gaza by Hamas or Islamic Jihad at the, at the moment. And a few of them, or some of them, I cannot say the, the majority because it's, you know, it's 240 families that have somebody kidnapped in, in Gaza and then the victims are around... 1,300, but some of them at least are saying very clearly, first of all, we don't want our name to be used for revenge or for killing anyone, and they oppose the mass bombard of Gaza and killing civilians, children, women, and men. That's first thing. Second of all, they say that their message in order... This is what their beloved one, their family, their relatives that were murdered believed, but also their belief is that on the long term, they need there need to be some solution uh, that is political, that is diplomatic, that is, you know, they're using different words, but what they say that more force and more walls and more, more of the same won't bring, bring real security uh, to the area in general, but also for them specifically. So they're calling to, to change the narrative, to change the uh, the way Israel thinks. Unfortunately, uh, you know, 
if their voices are not heard that much, you know, they're really big. They are interviewed in the media, but of course, uh, in all this wave of calling for revenge and calling for a second Nakba and other horrible, horrible things I don't even want to repeat, of course, their voices are not being heard enough. And what they fear, and also people like me fear, is that Netanyahu on a very basic level is not taking responsibility on the events, on, on, on the catastrophe that happened. And he says that this will happen after the war. And people fear that from that reason and from other reasons, he will just continue with this attack on Gaza for months or even more if he, he can. Uh, and people fear that he will just continue this to, to save himself and to, to keep the current political situation. So what, what do you both think about where, where, where this could actually go and what could happen? I mean, you're seeing, I mean, what, what, everything. Hey, where, before, sorry, before we where, go to where it's going, I just want to go back for something that you said. Is that okay? Sure. Um, sorry. I'm not sure how to get your attention, Mark. So I'm just, um, so since since what happened happened out here in the West, there's been a lot of um, conspiracy theories that have started to run about what happened on October 7th. Um, as you're very familiar with a disinformation in Israel of what's going on in Palestinian territories, it's kind of normalized to the point of um, total uh, either total blackout or complete fake news. Um, something similar is happening out West where um, disinformation about what's going on in Israel has led to the proliferation of conspiracy theories. And one of the prevalent ones is that the majority of the Israeli victims on October 7th were killed by Israeli forces, not by Hamas and Islamic Shihad. And I was just wondering, you were there on the ground the day of, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit, what is your response to that kind of conspiracy theory? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. It's very important. I I can say, first of all, and I, I, I say it every time, uh, first of all, I can say that for myself, I visited more than five communities uh, that were attacked on October 7, including the party, uh, the music festival party. I talked to dozens of witnesses dozens of witnesses, witnesses. I spoke to rescue forces. I saw some of the documentation, not all of it. And I can say uh, that, first of all, civilians in this attack, civilians were systematically targeted, not by a mistake or something that happened on the side, but as a main uh, goal of this attack. At least this is the result on the ground. I saw personally uh, bodies of uh, of uh, people that were murdered in their houses, in their safe room, in their beds, uh, with civilian clothes, and and I won't go into to graphic description, but this is a fact I saw, and I think also denying that or denying other things also prevents a real discussion about you know about other things. Furthermore, but. This is very important to 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 understand and to realize. Uh, of course, there's a lot of misinformation and uh, and fake news. Uh, I do. I can say that some amount of the of the people, the Israeli uh, that were held by Hamas in the villages, were probably killed by Israeli fire, but I cannot confirm the amount. I don't think it's all the cases. I don't think it's the majority of the cases. There has been some cases, but I'm saying it based on Israeli publication, open information that people uh, said, but definitely it's not even close to the to the majority. I think it's, you know, it still has to be investigated and me and many other journalists are working on these topics, and it might take a while for understandable reasons. Uh, And I also want to say that, of course, there's things uh, that maybe were exaggerated, but 
the basic fact that Hamas fighters, but probably also civilians that enter from Gaza, killed other civilians and not in a small scale, let's say, but in big scale, is something that I can confirm from what I saw, but also from all the independent investigation I did in the recent weeks. I know it might not be easy to people to hear, but I think it's also my obligation to say it without connection to, uh, you know, maybe other analysis or, you know, bring the background what happened before, what happened after, why did it happen, why did this catastrophe happen? But I have to be honest and, and say what I saw. Given what has actually just happened, what you've been describing, which you've been describing in your articles, these are a lot of civilian deaths. It's not two armies clashing. You've got, as I said, when I looked at the numbers, 72, 73% of the Palestinians who have been killed in Gaza are women and children. There may be 20,000 or more Gazans who are wounded and hurt. Their hospitals, they're down to maybe two or three hospitals at most inside of Gaza. And then the destruction in, in Israel itself, um, with all those innocent civilians killed in their homes on the kibbutzim at the at the at the music festival, and then you've got this really authoritarian leaning right wing fascist government. Twenty eight thousand injured. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> um, that that, that uh, and again, I said this is different than anything else I can remember in all my life. It's not. You know, the, I don't go back to 48, but I do go back to 56 and to 67. This is self, somehow fundamentally really different. I'm curious what you both think, analytically living through it, what comes out of this? What, what, what are the possibilities at the end of this, if there will even be an end? Leah, you want to start? You can. So I want to focus uh, just for a second on, I mean, the, 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 the impact on, on Gaza and the West Bank is horrific. But before we get there, I want to focus for a second on on Israel. Um, I think there was a couple of things that uh, Owen said that are incredibly important. One is that the mass movement against Netanyahu in the months leading up to the war um, has eroded the remaining faith that the society of Israel has in this government or government in general, largely because um, of the corruption and the the way that the governments have been responding. But um, the government responding to what happened on October 7th has, was kind of the nail in the coffin of the Israeli public faith in the government is the way that I'm understanding it. Now, on the one hand, when you have a, a, a really dangerous alt-right government, it's good that the public is losing faith in it. But in terms of the sustainability of day-to-day -day life in a country, when a mass um, of the population doesn't have faith in the government, that's an incredibly dangerous thing. And it opens the door to what we are seeing now, which is the arming of civilian militias, civilian Israeli militias, um, supported by Ben Gvir and other members of the parliament, um, and the training by the Israeli army of various groups of civilian militias. And God knows what they're going to do in terms of uh, attacking Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, I'm also seeing, um, since Netanyahu took over in uh, 2009, um, his governments, uh, all of his governments have been increasing repression and minimizing freedom of speech, minimizing right to protest, minimizing freedom of religion for non-Jews and increasing the fascistic um, movements in Israel and, and implementing fascistic, um, fascistic tendencies in the government. What's going on under the guise of war right now is, is, is uh, evidence of all of these years of the move to, towards um, towards those trends. And I was just hoping that uh, that um, Owen can uh, speak a little bit to that. What does that mean in terms of what you're seeing in terms of the freedom of Palestinian citizens of Israel to speak, um, of uh, Israelis who are critical of the government to speak? Um, we, we're hearing rumors of mass firings of people who are critical, of mass arrests of people who post anything critical of the government on social media, or even just critical of war efforts. How do you see um, the manifestation of these trends in terms of repressive laws and repressive movements and the strengthening of non-governmental fascistic forces like civilian militias? Yes, thank you for the question. I think, well, most of the Israeli public was shocked from the attack and busy 
griefing and burying people and just you know going through it it seems the extreme settlers in the West Bank but also the law enforcement the services the police the courts uh, were ready for this kind of event following May 2021 uh, in which there was a uprising and protests in East Jerusalem and inside Israel of Palestinians. So they were ready for this moment in, in different levels. So the settlers, first of all, escalated it immediately their attack on Palestinian communities in Area C, places that were already under pressure. Uh, the settlers just understood nobody's looking on what's going on in the West Bank, not the Israeli public, not the police an army that on normal days don't protect Palestinians, but escort uh, uh, the settlers. Many of the settlers were recruited to reserve service in the army, so they got actually uniformed weapon and are serving in their district. And they just escalated in uh, their attacks, going into Palestinian communities, uh, threatening people, giving them deadlines to leave. And we've seen 13, more than 13 communities that, sorry, We've seen 13 communities that entirely left and another five or six that partly left. We're talking about more than 800 Palestinians in this uh, few weeks. And it might see, seem a small number, but it's in a very strategic and important uh, areas of the West Bank. And it's the, continuous, it's the continuing of their policy to, to separate the West Bank to, to different uh, sections and, of course, to prevent any independent Palestinian state, even theoretically. And, of course, we've seen also an increase in the killings by the army. More than 150 people, Palestinians have been killed. It's almost the number we've seen all during all 2022, which was a year, uh, a record uh, since 2005, since the Second Intifada, and we've seen a few cases, uh, six of them, if I'm not mistaken, of settlers killing Palestinians. And of course, some of these cases were documented and nobody's held accountable. Meanwhile, inside Israel, the police, the fact that just cancelled all the freedom of speech rights people had. Today in Tel Aviv, uh, People were trying to hold a peaceful, quiet uh, vigil uh, to protest political arrest. This morning, the police uh, prevented the Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, leaders of the Palestinian community inside Israel, former parliament members to protest in Nazareth. They arrested six or seven of them. And following that, there was a vigil in Tel Aviv in which the police arrested 18 activists doing a protest against political arrest. So de facto, and this is said openly by the chief of police and by the police and said in court, they don't allow any demonstrations, even if they're very simplistic, very, with very simple message, calling for a ceasefire, calling the, to end the violence, nothing to, to radical, calling to freedom of speech. They just don't allow it. And they said it openly. The Supreme Court also kind of approved it, at least for protests in Arab villages and towns inside Israel. And also the police commander today, uh, one of the te te top Tel Aviv commanders, said during the demo, this is a war and we won't uh, uh, let you inside and just order his policemen to arrest randomly people who were standing on the street without even signs or without chanting anything. So we've, it's not that before freedom of speech in Israel, for sure for Palestinians, was perfect, far, far away from it. But we've seen a huge escalation that basically... In addition to the arrest on the street, we've seen a mass campaign against uh, any publication in Arabic on social media. So basically, anything said in Arabic can be criminalized if it's regarding the political situation and for sure if it's regarding Gaza. So uh, they opened more than 200 investigations and at least in 54 cases, uh, the trial already began. And it goes from people who are showing some kind of sympathy or happiness toward the events of 7th of October to people who just oppose killing children in Gaza or show some solidarity with Gaza. And then other people just wrote things in Arabic that were mis 
interpret were uh, not uh, interpreted well or not translated uh, correctly. Uh, but the result on the ground is that we barely see demonstrations. People are afraid to talk. People are being fired. So, of course, this, these trials, most of them haven't been started, but even though the trials have started, there's, it, there's no uh, conclusion yet in the courts, but already people are suffering from firing, from threatening uh, uh, by right wing and other people uh, People are being kicked out from university. So already this, and this is something we see it in every war that there's a attack on freedom of speech and freedom of expression. But this time it's completely different. People are really afraid to speak. I spoke to a Arab family from the north that lost their child. Their child was a medic, and they he was he was killed, murdered in the in the party in the south of Israel. And I went to interview them. Uh, regarding their story, the story of their son that was a uh, Palestinian citizen of Israel working there as a medic and saving people there before he was killed by Hamas. And when I asked them about political things, you know, just general things, they were afraid to talk. They told me, even though we lost our son, we can be arrested at every moment. And the, and the, the, the fear is ever. People are really afraid to go out to the street. Uh, we saw it tonight that after that, in, after in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, the police arrested people for protesting, calling for ceasefire and to end political arrest. Right-wing settler had a small protest in center Tel Aviv, calling to reoccupy, fully occupy Gaza, reestablish the settlements, and uh, transferring all the Palestinians out of Gaza. This protest, of course, was not dispersed. Nobody was arrested because this is the the current, and it's not surprising in any way, but it's es it escalated very quickly. Right-wing settlers can protest in Tel Aviv, calling for war crimes. They can commit war crimes in the West Bank. They are not held accountable. And then people who are literally calling for peace and coexistence and to stop violence in both sides, very, very simple messages, not something too radical or hard to explain, are being literally arrested uh, in the street. Things that, you know, we've seen before. Uh, uh, things that we are, we've seen before, but have been but increased very, very quickly. And my fear is that, uh, as we see from the past, rights that are taken in Israel are not brought back when this war or escalation or situation will end. And what we're thinking that this crazy right wing government with all their allies are not going to change the situation quickly after the war ends or if the situation is a bit more stable, even on the Israeli side. I mean, you know, the catastrophe in Gaza, it's not clear where they're gonna end, when they're going to end it. And even if they end the war, the situation there is going to be catastrophic for many, many years. But in addition to that, it's, it, the fear is that they will use this not to allow any criticism against the government. So before I come back to what I was asking earlier, I, I was thinking as you were speaking, Oren, just about your safety and the safety of other people who are covering this, journalists inside of Israel itself, and what you see, as what your experience has been, your, your colleagues' experiences have been, and how dangerous you see in terms of your own freedom and freedom of the press. But in what's happening in Israel at the moment. Yeah. So yeah, this, of course, it's first uh, important to, to mention that in Gaza, uh, journalists were killed and injured. And I talked to my colleagues and they say there's nowhere safe anymore. In previous wars, uh, offices of media outlets, of international media outlets were marked by the army and the army knew not to bomb them. It, of course, they did bomb them like the office of AP in May 2021, but at least there was some feeling there was some attempt of the Israelis not to to kill journalists. Now this has changed completely and, and we're hearing horrific stories from the journalists in Gaza and as I said, also working in unbearable conditions. In addition to that, I can say that inside Israel, especially for Palestinian journalists, the situation has been very, very dangerous. Uh, a, being attacked 
by right wing and even mainstream uh, people while broadcasting from the south of Israel, but also from center Israel. People are actively opening the phones, watching the channels in Arabic and looking for the presenters to attack them, to disturb them. Uh, this is, of course, backed up by the state that is trying to limit the broadcast of Al Jazeera and other channels uh, with uh, different claims. So we're seeing a situation that journalists are afraid to express themselves on social media, on even on just doing their, uh, their basic uh, work. I can say that uh, we try to, to, to move together like as, much, as many journalists as possible, especially when we go to the West Bank or to south of Israel. I can say that on the first day we got, uh, on the first day of on October 7th, uh, a few journalists we got to, to a situation that we were shot at by pal- probably Palestinian militants that were in the area. This is before we even understood the full uh, uh, situation, and we, before we understood there's so many Palestinian militants in the Israeli villages. Uh, but as I said, later on, the, the danger is internal, just you know, covering the demonstration, the police and right wing attacking and they see also the media as, as target. It's not that they uh, uh, believe in freedom of speech. Listen to everything you answered and the, and, and, and the stuff, that, the, the questions that Leah asked you and, and what you just responded about journalism. If you take that situation, look at the absolute devastation of Gaza, people being pushed further and further away from the Israeli border, what's happening now on the West Bank, Palestinians being moved out. You know the next step will probably be the most settlers taking over the land where people were just were pushed out. The repression going on with, with journalists, the repression going on politically right now that I've been reading about inside of Israel. I mean, this seems to me, to be, be, as I said when we started this conversation, a very different moment than I've ever experienced before. It seems to me that we're, the, the future looks really grim. I mean, it, it, with a right-wing kind of fascistic nationalist government in charge, just getting stronger. So I, I'm curious, I mean, just how you see things unfolding, what, what, and, and where the opposition comes from. I'd like to hear what both of you think about that. Oren? Yes, unfortunately, you're right. I don't see many optimistic, uh, I don't see an optimistic uh, future in the, near, in the nearby future. I think it doesn't seem that anyone wants to stop, wants or is trying to stop uh, Israel for for doing those actions in the West Bank and, of course, in, in Gaza. And it's, it's very scary. It's things we haven't seen before and things are not under control. Uh, I think another thing that is scary that is even the Israeli government are not really saying what their goals, horrific as they can be, they're not saying what their goals in this war in Gaza is. So Egypt made it very clear they're not going to let any refugees from Gaza. They're not going to allow a second Nakba to happen through their their gates or through their territory. And even mainstream people are starting to ask, well, you go to a a war, you risk the hostages. Soldiers are dying every day on the battlefield. and what's the end game of that? You know, even if the those slogans of Netanyahu and other ministers that it's hard to believe they are realistic, or, and I'm not talking even about the moral issues, but mm-hmm. even like the practical eliminate, el- eliminating Hamas and so on. Let's say you do it. What do you do the day after with this extreme right wing government? It's very clear, and this has been their policy for years to separate between the West Bank and Gaza, and, and they said it themselves in different occasions that Hamas is good for them because it keeps the separation from the Palestinian Authority and pre- prevents any diplomatic or political solution in the future. So where, when these people are leading uh, this war, it's really not clear how or if or when it will end. I think with time, more and more Israelis, even the ones from the protest movement against Netanyahu, but by the way, of many of them did go to reserve army, to reserve service in the military. I think with the weeks going on, 
people are starting to to realize that you know also in Israel this is a political war and it's not clear what the goals what the the targets and when it's going and when and how it's going to end so one thing I'm sure will happen is the uh, we will see again mass demonstrations against the Tanya with more people joining people we have uh, we haven't seen before protesting. Uh, that's that's for sure something we'll see in the very near future, in my opinion. Uh, in addition to that, I, I said it before, I can just hope, although I know the chances are not very big, that out of this catastrophe, people will realize that as in October 7, and this is something that I'm hearing from some of the families, in October 7, all this military force and defenses and cyber security didn't, in the end of the day, didn't protect the, the simple people who were living near the border. So we can only hope, and I know the chances are not big, that more people will realize that if we really want to live here one day, in a, if, not even in some good uh, situation, but just if we want to live here one day, there has to be another solution, like this uh, military solutions uh, using force have been tried for so many years and, and failed. And hopefully people will understand or start to understand that there has to be something different. What it is exactly, I think it's too early and too hard to say at this moment, not, not just for me, but for everyone on, on both sides, you know, but... I do hope, or at least I, I want to hope that I have, that something is possible that out of this catastrophe that we haven't seen in decades and we need, there's no words to, to describe it and that something else will, will grow. I have to say that it's very upsetting what's happening also inside Israel because you feel really that people, that many people or the majority just chose violence and of course maybe that's understandable reaction after the catastrophic and horrific attack of October 7 but it seems also many people just kind of gave up and said we're just going to live in a cycle of violence and horrific uh, crimes and, and just you know we'll get used to it or whatever and and this is why we hear about erasing Gaza and Second Nakba and other things. But even internally in Israel, it seems that the government for sure, but some of the public have gave up the hostages. Uh, and Netanyahu, it seems, you know, I, I didn't imagine that five weeks after the, uh, the October 7, we won't see any small deal of, you know, prisoners exchange or hostages exchange, at least the... Uh, elderly people, the children and the women, the soldiers that were captured, it's maybe a different story. But I didn't believe it as an Israeli that we won't see some kind of exchange. And there's huge support in the Israeli public. I talk to people who are, who are right-wing and they say we support releasing all the Palestinian prisoners, all the 5,000 political prisoners that were held in Israel before October 7th, in exchange of all the hostages. This is something you couldn't imagine before. But unfortunately, it seems that even in this front, the government just decided to go on full of war that is risking also the hostages that are inside Gaza. And it's not so clear if, if they will be uh, rescued and, and how. So, so this is something that, you know, is very upsetting from, from all sides, just, you know, that people choose, you know, choose to go in this path of violence and death. So before we have to close, um, Leah, did you want to have a, a closing thought? Well, the vast majority of the people in Gaza are refugees and the descendants of refugees from 1948. And I think that the level of destruction that the Israeli army, you know, hitting thousands of quote-unquote targets all over the Gaza Strip, the level of destruction has been so total that the only thing that makes sense is today is to take a look at those places where those people were expelled from. The vast majority of the villages and towns that Palestinians were expelled from in the Nakba uh, are standing empty. There's no towns on those places. 
Um, and I think that um, after this war, the only thing that makes sense is to allow a mass return of Palestinian refugees and the imposition of democracy instead of the theocracy and ethnocracy we're seeing in Israel right now. In terms of uh, changing, fundamentally changing the political system in Israel and allowing the return of refugees, that's the, as far as I can tell, that's the only way that we can move forward. And that's the only way to quote unquote destabilize Hamas which is a goal that the Israeli government has stated over and over again, but is doing nothing to achieve. Um, and it's the only way to actually end what we're calling these cycles of violence is the actual decolonization of the system of power that exists in Israel. And I, and I've tried, I try desperately myself to be optimistic about what could happen next. And I, you know, and it's, it's really difficult. I mean, I, and I, and I just heard what you said, Leah, and I, that is the only way. And when you see the, the 10,000 Gazans who were killed the the five the Israelis who were killed. I mean, it it's become, and the and the rise of this kind of neo fascist government in Israel, and doing I mean, in in being as authoritarian in some ways inside of Israel proper, and as it, it compares to the killings taking place outside in the Palestinian worlds, it's um it's a very frightening moment. Um, it really it truly is. And I, first of all, I want to thank Leah Tarachansky. I, I I I always appreciate having you with me on the air, and I doubly appreciate your thoughts and questions and pushing the conversation in directions that it has to go. And I really appreciate uh, you being part of this. And Arun Ziv, uh, I think that uh, your work is phenomenal. We're going we're gonna to be connecting to both your works. So people who really should check out what they're, what, what they're both doing. Uh, Arun, your articles are just, they just, um, your written pieces have just moved me. And they move the people I send them to as well. Incredible work. And I, I, I appreciate the bravery you showed uh, in standing up and doing the kind of work you're doing in, in Israel right now. Man, I know it's late in Israel. It's getting close to midnight. So I know you, <laughs> and you probably have a much a long day tomorrow again. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, I'll be happy to join again when things unfold and there's more updates. I look forward to only staying in touch. And Leah, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Leah. Always a pleasure. So um, I'm happy to thank all of you out there listening today for joining us today. And again, once again, thanking Leah and Oren for being part of this. Uh, and it's really late in Palestine and Israel, as I said. So thank you all for being part of this. And thanks to Cameron Grandino, David Hebden for running the show, editing and getting it up in the air, the tireless work of Kelly Rivara, making it all work behind the scenes, and everyone here at The Real News for making this show possible. And let me know what you think. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com. We're going to do much more of this in the coming weeks. We're not letting this go. And if you write me, I'm going to write you right back. And as I said, we'll continue our coverage of Palestine Israel. So thank you all for joining us today. It was great to have you all with us. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.